All right, welcome to Dr. B Music Theory. We're back again. I'm going to double check and make sure the stream is working correctly. But it's, it's good to be doing this again. I was, was planning on doing it uh, yesterday, but a number of things came up and sadly was not able to do it. Okay, here's the live stream. It says live now. Oh, uh, there we go. All right, looks like we're in business. So welcome again. I'm Dr. B. Uh, I've been teaching music theory for well over 20 years. Uh, I'm a professor uh, at multiple colleges, and uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, some of the music theory ideas, knowledge, uh, and answer some of your questions. So what I like to do, and I've been doing most of this summer, is a, get a, I get a question from, um, if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do that. And when you do that, you can ask me questions, and then I'll kind of put you at the top of the list. I'll do some prep work, and I'll, and I'll get a, a, an in-depth answer for you. Um, for those of you who, who aren't able to support me on Patreon, that's no problem. That's what I, why I have a YouTube here. You're welcome to ask me questions in the chat. Uh, I'm not even really going to look at the chat until I get done answering the big question. Uh, and so just so you know, I, I do do my homework. I do some preparation. I take a look at stuff. I answer it. I think about it. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, before we get started and before I forget, as I mentioned, I'm in charge of, of music at one of the colleges. And that includes, actually, uh, what's called credit-free music, okay? So this is for music for kids and adults, and we have everything online, we have all sorts of classes, we have amazing teachers, and uh, I just found out that some people are, are watching the, 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 this, this stream, uh, and someone from California signed up to take music theory with one of our awesome teachers that teaches for the academy. So it's the Dutchess Community College Academy of Music. We're all online this fall. So you can take music theory lessons and coaching. Um, you can take whatever, whatever it is you need. Um, so it's, it's um, Dutchess Community College Academy of Music. You can Google it. Uh, it has a YouTube, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, as well, and we've been making some behind the scenes videos to kind of show people what it's like to take an online class. Sometimes we have group classes. So anyways, uh, I'm happy to see that some of you have thought to yourself, you know, I need a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, let's sign up for a great tutoring lesson. And you can do that through the academy of music that I kind of oversee. I, I don't do those myself because I'm so busy with other obligations. I try to make these videos so to reach as many people as possible. But I oversee the academy, so I kind of make sure that those people, if you sign up for someone taking music theory through the Academy of Music, it's my job to oversee that they're doing a good job teaching you. So that's my endorsement and my little advertisement, so please forgive me for that. So let's, let's get started. So this comes from uh, grade eight, uh, a Royal Academy of Music exam. So something done over in London, England, uh, the UK, there's a whole s uh, testing board. It's kind of like uh, advanced placement in the United States, uh, but, but goes up to higher levels. So this is, this is from uh, a, a, a YouTube watcher of mine who, who's studying for this exam. And this is one of the questions. And so then what he was asking is like, how do I study for this? How do I get ready? How do I answer a question of this complexity? And let me read the directions for you. It says, complete the given outline of the following passage adapted from a piano piece by Renecki, 1824 to 1910. So all the information they give you in the directions is important, including that it's a composer, 1824 to 1910. And so, you know, as, as a lover of music, you should be voraciously curious about everything music. So you should be like, who's this Renecki guy? What's up with music from this time period, 1824 to 1910, so late 19th century? That's going to actually help you in answering this question because there's certain harmonic and music theory things that were popular at that time period. So take this as an opportunity to to satiate your curiosity and go look up uh, some of this, this composer. And I'll, and I'll try to remember to put some links uh, in the description here. But I'm going to keep all of that in mind. So they're giving us, you can see there's like blank stuff, right? So sometimes it's an entire measure. 
Sometimes it's like the, the, the right hand of the piano. Sometimes it's the left hand of the piano that's missing. And we have to kind of compose something that is in the style of late 19th, late 19th century, or late, yes, late 19th century piano music. So how do we do this? The first thing I want to do is I want to look for phrases. Okay, so the phrase bar. The most common phrases are four bar phrases, four measures. So let's see if that happens, right? So this is a pickup, right? And we got measure one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and number these. One, two, three, four. Okay. Does this look like this could be another phrase? Well, we have a, this quarter note pickup of dotted eighth, sixteenth. We have it again here. So perhaps this is a, a similar pickup to another phrase. Let's hope so. Five, six, seven, eight. Again, we have this dotted eighth, sixteenth note pickup. So that looks promising so far. Measure 9, 10, 11, 12. No pickup here, but we do have that quarter rest that you see in, in, in the other location at the end of the phrase. Then we have 13, 14, 15, 16. So this looks good. This looks like very traditional four measure phrases. That's really important. So I'm going to mark those in. One, two, three, four. With a, little, with a little breath mark or a little phrase mark. Uh, this is often used for wind instruments, but I'm going to just do that to show that's where the phrases are, right? So we got that phrase, that phrase, and we got something here. It's probably going to be, I'm going to put it here, assuming there's a pickup. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, okay? One, two, three, four. So step one, look at the example. See if you can figure out what the phrase structure is. Start with four measure phrases. That's the most common. If you're in luck, your job is done at that point. Then the next thing you're going to want to do is kind of look and see if there's any um, kind of sub phrases. Like, can you divide those four measures into two measures? Because that, be, that might be relevant, right? So if we have this, then we kind of have this blank stuff. You know, so we could maybe treat these first two measures and these second two measures as kind of similar. So we can maybe transpose some of this from this to this. Same thing here, is this two measures, two measures? So it's not super obvious that that's what's going on, but we might try to create that in our composition. Here with dam, da dam, and then we have dam, da dam. So here we definitely see it, right? We definitely see the little subphrase. So I'm going to put a little, uh, it looks a lot more like a one. Uh, I'm going to put a, a little bracket like that, because that definitely looks like a, a two measure subphrase. Uh, and that's going to be important when we see this dam, da dam, dam, da dam going up a step like a sequence. So I'm kind of starting to look at what's there. I don't just start at the beginning and start composing. That would be the worst thing you could do. You need to look at the holistic thing, look for all the different aspects so that you can take those and kind of just rework them into the parts that are missing. So after I've looked at phrases and subphrases, um, and again, not every phrase is going to ha have a, a subphrase, but you know, some of them might. I'm gonna now going to look at the rhythm, the rhythmic character of this. Most important is this dotted eighth sixteenth, which is here, 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 here. This is like a super important. And notice that it goes in this in, in the first place. It goes up by step, and then it has a repeated note. So I'm going to play this a little bit on the piano, just so you can hear it. Right. And the next one. So it goes down to a D, but it has the same A with the repeated note. And then coming up with the end of the eighth measure. So there it goes down by step, but it still has that repeated note. Repeated note. So whether it goes up by step or down by step, we have both. Up by leap, also an option. But in every single circumstance, the 16th was repeated to the downbeat of the next measure. Da da. You should not do anything other than that if you write a dotted eighth sixteenth. You should not be like, oh, I'm going to do something different for variation. No, don't do it. Use the material that's been given to you and do variations, but that's an essential characteristic that is immutable. Do not change that aspect. 
you also notice that there's no section here with a bunch of moving eighth notes, like a Bach uh, piece where you often have the passing tones and the bass line and things like that. You don't have it, so don't add that. You don't see any 16th notes. You don't see any triplets. Don't use things that you do not already see in the example. It is much, much better to take what's there and readjust, rework it, than try to come up with something brand new. That's not, it's not gonna, probably not gonna fit musically. So even if you thought, oh, this is gonna be rarely musical, it's probably not. Uh, and then you're taking an exam. You're trying to show that you understand the style of what's there. And classical composers are the experts at taking a theme and developing it. There's very few other styles of music are that good at theme and, and variation, theme and development. So we want to stick with that idea. So we notice that rhythmically we have this dotted 16th note with the repeated. We then have predominantly quarter notes in the melody after that. Right, so quarter notes, lots of quarter notes. Here we have a dotted quarter eighth. That's the only time we have it. Everything else is essentially quarter notes, except for the very end, which looks like a cadence. So we know we're going to probably use a bunch of quarter notes. Let's look at the rhythm of the accompaniment of the left hand. So we have half notes, quarter notes, dotted half notes. Again, predominantly quarters and halves, we're, and, and some dotted halves. We're going to use that when we start composing. But you can see already how much time you need to spend looking and making a conscious note of what it is that you're seeing from all these different aspects. So after you've done at that, looked at that, you then kind of look at the contours of the mel melody, melodic contour, okay? So we see dum, da, da, then a leap, leap, two leaps in a row, interesting, okay? Normally when we've talked about uh, writing four-part harmony with Johann Sebastian Bach, it's leap, then step back in the opposite direction. The rules are different here. This is late 19th century piano music, so one, it's instrumental, and that, therefore there's often more leaps right off the bat, and two, it's late 19th century. They like their leaps. It makes it feel more longing and more dramatic. So we know that we might have a few more leaps. Then we, so let's take a listen to it. And again, if in an exam, you might not be able to play on the piano. You'll have to kind of sing this in your head. So practice your ear training. And that sounds like a little pickup to me, right? Bum, bum, right? This da, da. I'm sure this is a repeated G. I'm like, I'm positive. I can just tell, right? So this sounds like a subphrase. So I see an obvious subphrase because of this dotted eighth sixteenth note. That sounds like it's going to be some kind of sequence, some kind of repetition of this, but at a lower pitch level. So I know that's a subphrase, and I know in this third phrase, that also is obviously a subphrase. And so I'm trying to make my life as easy as possible. I'm looking for when I can just kind of copy something at a different pitch level. That's where I'm. That's where my head's looking forward to. So we looked at the contour. We noted that. Now let's take a look at harmony, right? So we've got G, F, A. Boy, I'm already, right? If you could, like, I can just picture it now. How many people start panicking right there? G, F, A. It's not a triad. It's, it's not a seventh chord. There's no, it's not G, B, D, F. And there's an A. What's going on, right? Don't panic. Don't panic. This is where, you know, this is where he's studying and, and looking at, the music of Renecki and other 19th century composers. So I'm going to say that this, this looks suspiciously like, you know, missing notes, right? G, D, right? So we could say G, F, A, D. If there was just a B in there, it would be a nice G9 chord, right? There's no B. But if there was, we'd be set. And if we kind of like try to use our ear to hear what that would sound like. Yeah, the power of tertial harmony stacked in thirds. You know, our ear's going to kind of hear that. Now, whether it's going to be a B natural or a B flat, you could say, well, Dr. B, how do we know it's not, you know, I'm hearing a, a, a very much a G, G9, like a G dominant type of harmony. Not. I, 
I, you know, and, and I guess I haven't even, I didn't even really think about it, to be honest. Why did I, I mean, there's the key signature, right? But that doesn't help me as a listener, right? If I was just hearing this, why would I assume G with a major third as opposed to the minor third? But my ear does. I think it has to do with that a major triad is objectively, scientifically more stable than a minor triad. It, it's lower on the overtone series. So if your ear is going to substitute something when there's missing information, it's going to substitute the most expected thing. And a B natural is more expected than a B flat in this situation. And if you think about it, this is, as a composer, this is, a, this is like elite high level comp comp composing. Sometimes it's nice to give people incomplete information. You kind of have to make them use their imagination. There's like, they fill in the blanks. And so what you have to know is when you leave something out, what is, what is it that the ear assumes? And in this case, it's going to be that B natural. They're going to, you're going to hear it as a G9 chord. So I kind of look at that and I say to myself, OK, um, we're dealing with harmonies that are beyond just triads. We got ninth, ninths in there, right? So let me just, so we got G, B, D, F, A. The A is the ninth, so root, third, fifth, seven, nine. So it's an, what's called an upper structure. And the other thing I'm going to notice is that this, it doesn't go and resolve to like a C chord, like a one chord in the key. I mean, I mean Looking at this, I'm like, are we in C major? Are we in A minor? With this G9, I'm going to assume C major, but that might not be the case. I mean, late 19th century, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing like, there's a lot of accidentals. There's a F sharp here and a D sharp here, a C sharp and a B flat, uh, F sharp over here, whole bunch of sharps over here. I mean, this might be, this might not be as simple as, you know, one, four, or five. It's, it might be a little more complicated. So I'm kind of kind of wait and see. But I'm just observing what's going on harmonically. So right here, G, D sharp, F sharp. This definitely this sounds like non-chord tones, right? So I'm not going to worry about that. But we kind of have this G, almost like a. And I notice it kind of looks like a pedal. I mean, it, not necessarily in the technical sense of a pedal tone as a non-chord tone that's not in the chord, but as a, something low that's repeated as like a, uh, like a foundational thing. So that idea is also going to influence how I'm going to conceive of the harmony. Uh, so if I were to look at this, I'm going to look G, E. So maybe that's a E minor and first inversion, but the G kind of assumes, kind of gives me this pedal feel. So maybe it's all just in this G area, right? So all an elaboration of G. So harmonically, that's what I'm seeing there. And, and that's where I'm going to start. Uh, and I'm going to kind of have that as my foundation in the back of my head. Non-chord tones, uh, again, this bottom, bottom. So these are all like, uh, like a pagiaturas. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to even label those, right? So I know that that's something that's going on. That's part of the harmonic language of this piece. So there's the harmony and then the non-chord tones that also influence the harmonic language. Finally, I'm going to look for symmetry and sequence whenever possible. So just like I said here, bum ba da, bum ba da. I'm going to try to do something that's very similar. And here, going into the third phrase, da da da, da da da. I'm going to try to do something similar. So I'm always going to look for sequences. And, and, and that type of thing. Lastly, the other thing I want to point out is when you have these two non-chord tones, D sharp, F sharp, I note the interval of, of how, what's being on. And, we have, and it resolves up parallel sixes. So this is a six that moves to a sixth. Uh, if we, when you do species counterpoint, you also often pay very close attention to the relationship of those intervals, especially in a case like this, where those intervals are, are dissonant and then resolve. Those are important to note. Um, my last thing that I'm going to mention is that you'll notice that in the question, you have dynamic markings. You have phrase markings, decrescendos, crescendos, accents. Do not forget. This is how you like really impress when you 
impress people when you're taking that test. Do not forget to add phrase markings and expressive markings to whatever it is that you compose to complete this question. That's going to show that you have an attention to detail, which is what they're looking for. Um, keep in, in mind part of what an exam is meant to do at the Royal Academy of Music or any of the elite institutions in the United States or in any other country. It's to see whether you have the requisite skills to be given entry, meaning that the, they're teaching courses at a certain level, right? They can't just go at whatever speed you're at. They need you to reach a certain level. And they want to make sure that you're going to be able to be successful with an appropriate amount of work and you have enough of those fundamentals. Also, this is kind of like from a, the professor's perspective. I want you to make me look good. If I'm, and if I'm in an institution and you get a degree from my institution, I want you to be good at what you do so that when people say, hey, where did you go to school? And you tell them, my reputation is good. So uh, one of the reasons that sometimes students will say, oh, Dr. B, can't we slow down? This is too hard. It's too complicated. I'm like, you know, we can't. I, I, mean, I can give you some extra help outside of class, but in the class, we need to keep moving. We have, when you graduate, I'm kind of giving you the pledge that you are prepared. If you can pass the class, you are then prepared to move on to the next step. It's kind of like a stamp of approval, and it has to mean something. Um, it should mean something, right? That's what education, you know, to get on my soapbox for a second, <laughs> that's what an education should mean, a degree, a certification. It should mean that you have these skills and also that you have the uh, attention to detail and the, you know, the, the, the reliability. You, know, you come to class, you do your homework, so that when you go off to, let's say, get employed in some fashion, that an employer doesn't have to be like, you know, who knows whether, you know, it takes some of the guesswork out for an employer, whether you're going to be showing up for work or just you know, calling in sick every time you want to play you know, PlayStation late, late at night, whatever it is that might be distracting you. So uh, it's important to show that you have this attention to detail, that you, you have the passion, you have the, the care, uh, and, and adding phrase markings is something that's often overlooked. So now that we've spent a, a good, healthy amount of time learning and figuring out what's going on from what's given, let's now try to compose and fill it in. So I'm going to fill it in uh, with the blue marker. And we had da 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 di da, da. I'm going to try to do something bum ba bum. I'm definitely putting a G here, no question. And I'm going to try to do that same contour. I'm going to leap down. So I'm going to I'm going to leap down to a ba bum and back up to a G. And that's because I kind of see that we're in this G area, and I want to keep it going. And that's kind of like a little sequence, right? So e da da. And if I want to go G, I don't want to go down to a C here because that won't be in a G chord. And I want to kind of just keep the G thing going. So I make it jump all the way down to a B. And then I do the same thing where I jump down to a, an appoggio, to a, a non-core tone, and then resolve it up by half step. So I'm doing that same little formula. So I can't really, if I'm going to jump down, I, I don't want to go to, F, I have to go to something lower than the F sharp because I'm moving a sequence down. So E sharp is the same thing as N harmonically as F, so that doesn't make sense. But D sharp is like the next note. So that's, that's what I come up with. And I notice that this is how it's phrased, right? There's a slur that covers just like that. And I create a little sequence into this melody. Now I notice that there's a, uh, this is a dotted half note in the second measure in the accompaniment, and there's nothing here. So I'm going to put in the quarter rest, because it's a pickup, right? Just like there was a quarter rest at the very beginning. I'm going to kind of keep that idea, so in that part. And I'm going to just keep the same accompaniment. I'm just going to keep it all on this G, this kind of G7. And I'm going to use the exact same rhythm. I'm just going to keep it going. Now when I get here, the E is definitely not in. And maybe here's the time for me to go to a C chord, right? Because we know G7 likes to go to C. So I'm going to do that, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to focus in on getting to the C. So I put the C here as a half note, just like they did here. 
But since we have a quarter rest, I make it a half note instead of a dotted half. And then I say D sharp, OK, well, I want to have this. This was a 6, D sharp to F sharp. So here I have a D sharp. What if I just invert the two, right? Why don't I just put it F sharp here, right? So check out how interesting that could be. Here it went F sharp to G in this top part and D sharp to E. Now I invert the two. I put the slur in, and I get myself a C major triad. And actually, I, could, I can put that on beat one, because the non-core tones don't change where that harmonic motion is. So take a listen to how that works as my next phrase. So here's the first phrase. Second phrase. So it's a nice sequence. It's pretty. It uses what we already had and expands upon it. Now, we have the same kind of pickup, but now it's a leap going into our, our second full phrase. So, so this was like a, like a subphrase within the first phrase. Here we see something different. So this is a quarter note at the beginning. Here we have a dotted quarter note eighth. So I don't see, like it doesn't look like subphrases. Maybe I can take the accompaniment here and do something similar here. Um, and I see this GF with the A, so that looks like the G9 again. And it kind of steps down, C sharp, B flat. That screams to be a C sharp diminished seven. And then D A with a perfect fifth, it's almost definitely a D minor triad if we keep the, the F naturals going that we've, we've introduced here. Um, so I kind of sketch out the harmonic part of things. And I kind of look that I have an A here and I need to get to the E, right? And there's a couple other things that I kind of note in terms of what I want to do. If this is a C sharp diminished seven, you know, it certainly would be great to have the E in there or the G, right? So maybe I want to aim to an E and here D, A would be great to have the F, right? So I'd love to have those pitches to complete the chord. And it kind of keeps me down into, to where I need to be next. So the question is, with this A, how do I get to this A to the E? How do I get there? And let me say that again. I, I, I figured out harmonically that this is probably a C sharp diminished 7, and that E or G would be good notes. I chose the E because this, it, goes, it goes very nicely to this F. But the G could do it as well. So either one, you got an option there. But I like that this kind of like da da, this half step that they had with the F sharp G in the beginning, kind of keeps that idea uh, of that ascending half step resolution. If you remember, I, I pointed out that we had a, a six between the intervals here with this F in the bass, F E D, F A. That's a third. So what if I were to have parallel thirds? and just walk it down. So just go down the scale to connect it. And there, and there have that, that bit of the phrase. So let's, let's hear what that second part of the phrase is. Parallel thirds, parallel sixes, they're so, they're so good. This is the pickup to the second phrase, or the fifth measure. works. That sounds good, right? And then here, since I love sequence and I love repetition, I'm going to try to do something similar uh, in terms of what I'm going to get to um, in terms of this part, right? The C sharp diminished to the, to the D minor, but I'm going to try to make that onto my, my cadence here, right? So, Here's what I came up with. I decided that this, I'm going to do a similar quarter note accompaniment with the right hand. So I'm going to make this kind of sound like, a, like an A, an A major triad on first version. And I'm going to kind of keep that same, 
apologize, this blue marker is getting a little, a little light. So I'm going to actually switch over to the black marker here. Um, and hopefully you remember what's being added and what's, what was originally there. And I'm going to step up and I'm going to make this a D sharp diminished seven going to E minor. Uh, actually, keep that same voicing too. Put a, and I'll point out to as soon as I get done writing it so you can see it. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just kind of highlight with blue underneath. This is added. This is new, new material that we composed. So, so. I'm taking the same kind of, instead of going down, I'm now going up, so inversion. And I'm looking at this C sharp diminished and saying, ah, how about I do a D sharp diminished going to E minor, just again, up a step. Um, and experiment with that. And so if that's the case, I kind of want to do the same thing where I have, so this had the C sharp B flat, this has the D sharp C, so root seven, root seven going to the open fifth. I'm going to do the same thing harmonically with the melody, which means I need an F sharp going to a G. And I'm going to put the blue under there to indicate that this is something we composed and added. All right, so let's, let's take a listen and hear what that sounds like. So here we're starting at the, uh, at the seventh measure. We've got So let's hear the whole second phrase starting pick up to measure five. Right, so it's, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, maybe not the, the greatest melody. Um, I didn't have any, you know, you could maybe try to put in a dotted eighth, sixteenth here uh, to kind of keep that similar motive in the subphrases, but it kind of, you kind of get a sense of where I'm coming up with stuff and how I'm trying to get to where I'm going uh, by taking one accompaniment and saying, how can I do like a variation of that? Instead of going down, go up. So here, this next phrase is very, has some really great things to pay attention to. You notice the pickup goes, and then you get pick up to 11. Notice that it gives you three quarter notes in a row here. So let's just do that same thing here. Let's just go ahead and take that. So we'll just take that information. I'm going to bracket the stuff that we know are going to, we need to add stuff to so I don't forget and so that it's clear to you after the fact what's been added. Um, Actually, this continues all the way to here. We need to add to here, and then we need to add that. Okay, so like you've got these faint blue brackets underneath the stuff we're going to compose. So I'm just taking this and putting it here. Um, and after I, I, after I do that, I'm going to basically, this is just up a step. So I'm going to take this exact same accompaniment and move it up a step, which basically means uh, that we are taking it and going. Um, so this is essentially F sharp A. This is a D major triad. These are lower, lower chromatic lower neighbors. So this is all basically a D major. Then we have G with the A sharp with the B. This looks like a G major triad, right? That A sharp, again, is kind of a non-core tone appoggiatura. And since we had that da-da and we put it in, in, um, in parallels, I'm going I'm to keep that in my melody. I'm going to add a C sharp D. And I'm going to put a slur marking because that's the way it is here. And actually, there's an accent on this. Uh, I, we already have that. Oops. 
So I'm going to make sure I have an accent in, on the other one. It's a little too close, but you get the idea. So I, how, why, how did I come up with doing the C sharp D here for the melody? Well, because this A sharp B looks very similar to this D sharp E. And before, it would move in thirds. And we know the inversion, I'm sorry, move in sixths. And we know the inversion is a third, and that keeps us and completes our G major triad. So I pay attention to the harmony, and I look for previous things that I can kind of copy. Dun, da, dun. So when we go to the E, we know we got to just transpose everything up to B, G sharp. Now, I, didn't, I could have made it a G natural, but I, I don't think that, that usually when you have a sequence, it, it's, it's, it's very common to kind of turn everything into a major triad in a, like a circle of fifths sequence or uh, kind of progression. So it keeps the forward motion, and I think it's stylistically a little bit more correct for late 19th century. Um, so if we do that, then we know that we go to A sharp, and here's the place where you'd want to use your F double sharp. Check that out right there. Because I don't want to rewrite the accidental, I don't want to write, G, G sharp, G natural, G sharp. That's too many accidentals. I can just write the F double sharp. So for those of you who have, who have, have asked, why use double sharps? That's the reason right there. So that I'm only writing one, two accidentals versus one, two, three accidentals. Um, and it kind of, it, it's less information that the eye has to process. It kind of makes it clear that this and this are the exact same thing. I'm going to put a slur over it. Just like that, a phrase marking. And I'm going to do the same thing here. Uh, I'm going to make it um, um, an A natural half note with the B sharp going to the C sharp right there. So I put a slur and an accent. I know I apologize that it's a little sloppy. So I'm going to keep the same idea and put the D-sharp E here, which means I'm going to an A major, and this is E major. So D, G, up a step, E, A, little sequence. And that's how I come up with my, my third phrase. So let's take a look at that. Let's see, we got... a little sequence and again just taking what's already there so here there's a, a quarter note missing if you don't put in a dotted 8 16th note there whoever's grading this exam is gonna be like this person is has no idea what they're doing right it's like it's begging to have that right there so you just got to pick up pick you know what interval so I'm gonna go you know this has got to, because it's a G here, it's got to be a G, and there's some kind of, here's what it's not up for debate. It's got to be a dotted eight 16th here. This has got to, the 16th has to be a G. What happens below the first note, the dotted eighth note? There you might have some um, opportunities for other options. Let me backtrack just a second and, and show you the difference uh, of that third phrase if I had stuck with E minor instead of E major. So here I'm starting on, the, on measure nine. Let me play the E major sequence, right? So I keep it, keep it like. If I went to E minor and, and made it a diatonic sequence instead of chromatic, I don't think it would be as good. Listen. We have the versus. So because I want that sequence to be obvious, I'm making it so that the sonorities are the same. Major, major, as opposed to making it a diatonic sequence where the sonorities change. So 
right here, your pickup has some options. With this descending here, um, we're, we're, what am I going to do with the accompaniment? That's my question. Well, I look forward and I see that I have this D B natural. So that, that kind of low dot and a half notes reminds me of the beginning, right? And at the beginning, we were on G, and the G was the lower note. But here we have D. So what if this was all essentially the same idea of like a D7 instead of a G? Now it's like a D7. And we just did the same type of thing in the accompaniment rhythmically and harmonically. And we just go bum, bum, suspension, third, nine. Again, that nine that was so pr prominently featured, here, here it's functioning more like a, like a passing tone, but it, we slip it in there, right? So that's how I kind of come up with, with what I'm going to do with the accompaniment. Because I see this aspect, this part in the accompaniment, and I say, OK, let's just do it now on, on D. And AG, this looks like scale degree 2 to scale degree 1 to me. Looks like we're going to cadence in G. So this big D pedal leading to a G makes a lot of sense harmonically. Often in romantic music, you have more of these like kind of areas that are like a dominant area. And it has all this kind of embellishment and stuff that's going on, some non-chord tones, some upper structures. The general motion of 5 to 1 still exists, but sometimes it, it's spun out over a longer period of time. So this is essentially what I'm doing. We're going D here for a while, um, like a D7. And so what did I come up with melody-wise? I came up with just keep walking down the scale, complete what looks like a G major triad with D in the bass. Okay, so I, I complete the chord. So that's why I decided to go with the D. And then I want to leap because leaps were something that were part of it. I want some more dotted eighth. 16th notes, so I'm going to put that in. I'm going to emphasize a ninth again right here. So here's a nine as, a, oh, as like a, an escape tone. I'm going to go back to the accompaniment being DC in the left hand, same rhythm. And then I'm going to finally resolve it. So take a look at that. And let's, let's listen. This is pick up to measure 13. I could have done some things differently, right? So I could have like in that penultimate measure, measure 15, I could have gone. Let me do that again. Here's, here's, here's what I wrote. Here's the other option. I'm oh, sorry. So what did I do? Uh, what I wrote was an E. You could also put a D. The D would make it the melody go three one, uh, three one of the, of the chord of the D seven chord, right? Or scale degree set, you know, if we're in the key of G seven five two one, da da. You could go to the root, but I didn't. Why? Because I'm good. I want to emphasize these ninths, right? This is what was given to us. This is part of the harmonic language. So da da nine, but it's it's like an escape tone. Um, and there we go. So let me play for you the whole example. And you can kind of hear, you know, does it sound like music? And that's kind of what we're going for. It sounds like a complete example. Okay, here we go. Uh, nice and slow for me. Uh, sorry.
go. So I hope that, uh, that that's a, a, a lengthy, lengthy answer. Let me re re regroup. You take a look at what you have. You look at the phrasing. You try to say, what's the phrase structure? What subphrases there are? Uh, you look at the rhythmic quality of both the melody and the accompaniment. And you try to use that. You look at the contours of the melodies, where, when things go up, when things go down, when there's leaps. You look at the harmony, whether there's ninth chords. You look at what, what, what pieces of the harmony might be missing so you can know what melody note you might want to put in. You then look at non-chord tones and you try to use similar qualities of non-chord tones in what you're writing. You look at symmetry, you try to establish sequences. You look for thirds and sixes uh, as ways to try to create nice, pretty harmony. You add the phrasings, dynamics, articulations, accents, things like that. Great. Well, I am going to see now. Oh, good. We have some people in the chat. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, I'm going to take a look at that. Oh, people saying hello. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have a question about doing an orchestration using an example of four voices. Uh, I would like to see a lesson of orchestration with you. Okay, an orchestration using an example of four voices. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's one of those bigger ones that I would probably need to do uh, a bit of prep for. So I won't be able to answer that now. So four voices. Let's think about, you know, uh, and, I, and I take a look at this, soak it in, take a screenshot. I'm going to erase it momentarily. It's a work of art. I love this stuff. I, I, you guys might think I'm crazy, but hopefully uh, it's the right kind of crazy. I love looking at something like this when it's done. It looks, I, I think it looks beautiful. It's, it's like all the combination of like math, science, art, all rolled into one beautiful thing. So anyways, hurts my heart, but it's got to be done. So here we go. Let's make some space so we can talk about orchestration. And I'm going to give just some basic fundamental things to, to think about. And I've talked about orchestration, and I've recommended the, um, I believe it was the Samuel Adler orchestration book in one of my previous videos recently was one of the live Q&As. So I, I gave a lot of good tips on where to get started and talk about orchestration. I talked about Stravinsky and his orchestration a little bit. But if we're going to do orchestration with four voices, four parts, um, and let's assume we're not talking about actual voices, so we're talking about, let's say, a string quartet. Which means you have a violin one, violin two, viola, and cello. This is the, this is Franz Joseph Haydn, he like, it's like you experiment and you find out that the right string quartet is not violin, viola, cello, bass. This is the right version so that things are in the range that just resonate the best. Or uh, let's take a saxophone quartet because as a saxophone player, I am familiar with those. Where you have soprano sax, alto sax, tenor sax, and then baritone saxophone. There's you can have brass quartets. All of these ensembles uh, essentially are trying to consider about the range. You want to have an instrument that can handle the bass. Now, keep in mind, in, even in the orchestra, the, the double bass, that name double bass, might be in part because it's doubling what used to be played by the cello. So it's doubles it an octave lower to give it even more bass. But early orchestras, the, the bass was kind of an optional part. It just helped make it a little bit deeper and a little bit richer. It was covered in the cellos. So you don't need it to go super low when you're just dealing with four instruments. When you got an entire orchestra, yeah, adding an extra octave below really helps, helps with the balance. So range of the instruments, balance is the word I just used and something that you're going to need to keep in mind as an orchestrator. You want to make sure that that you don't have too much bass or too much treble in the mix. So you want to fig figure out what instruments are going to go together. So that's why like bassoon is a great wind, so wind instrument uh, for handling bass lines. Uh, 
Um, so range, you got a bass instrument, you got usually two melody instruments, like the, the super high melody and the middle, medium melody. And they often will play in tighter harmonies, right? So you have these two melody instruments, and then you have your instrument that often completes the harmony. Now, good orchestrators will make sure that your viola and your tenor saxophone get some melody and get some melody in that more lower mid-range. Um, but that's not your, usually your default orchestrational technique. Usually the melody goes in the top. The second one is supporting the melody in thirds or sixes. The viola or tenor sax completes the chords and your cello or baritone sax is providing the bass. So those are your kind of fundamentals of what you're doing when you're talking about orchestration. You then start talking about timbral colors and which colors go well together. Um, so these are all like instruments. So violin, all violin family, all saxophone family. That's easy because they're all the same instrument, just different, you know, it's like recorder ensemble. Uh, and this was something that was really common from, from the Renaissance where you, you would have consorts. They would call them a consort all of a similar instrument, just with different ranges. And once you get into the classical era, more and more, you start having mixed. So you'll have things like flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, let's say. Um, these are all wind instruments, but they're not, not the same kind of wind instrument. So they're more of a mixed ensemble. And you can mix it up even more, right, when you start mixing winds, woodwinds. These are, these are all woodwinds. So woodwind with brass with string. That, it's less common, though. It's, it's just less common because it's a lot harder for an orchestrator to make them sound like they come together and blend. So those are the things you're, look, you're thinking about as an orchestrator. Does, it, does these individual voices come together, blend, so that you get a, a full harmony that resonates and sounds like a harmony and not like little splashes of color, like a pointillistic type of, like a pointillistic painting? But it ha if there is any kind of pointillism, it has to come together at some distance to, to create something that's cohesive and comes together. So that's some, some very quick orchestration stuff, anything Anything more in depth would require a bit more preparation. I'd want to give you exact melodies uh, and examples. And maybe I'll do that at some point in the future. I'll definitely make a note of that. So thank you for that question. It was an excellent question. All right. Yeah, so I'm doing live. Yeah, orchestration would be, OK, two, two votes for orchestration. I'm going to write this down here. So when I get done, I can uh, make a note to myself. This is something that. It's, it's popular. All right, Andrew Norris. Hey, over in Croatia. All right, another question. Thanks for your lessons. How would you write a four, five, uh, seven, five, seven, one progression in the key of C for SATB with A, B, C, D, E being the melody and F, G, A, G, C in the bass line? Okay, so this is something very specific. So let's uh, roll up our sleeves and see if we can answer this this question. I'm going to read it again. It is, chord progression is four, five, now that looks like seven, which, which really should be seven diminished. I'm just going to write what they wrote. Five, seven, one, in the key of C, melody being A, B, C, D, E. Well, that's going to be some. There's going to be some problems with that. And bass line F. G, A, I think they meant six, G, 
Let's see. Yeah. So I think they wrote, accidentally wrote, yeah. I'm pretty sure this is actually, they didn't put the diminished symbol. The notes they say don't really make sense for that. So I think they meant six. You can correct me if I'm wrong when I look down lower. You can let me know. But with the, with the notes, that's pretty much what you, you're going to have to, it, it makes sense. Now, five to six is a perfectly uh, good deceptive resolution. So deceptive resolution. Usually you would not, would not go directly here back to 5.7. That, that's a little unusual. But, you know, with smooth voice leading, you can make it work. So how would I do this for SATB? All right, so I'm going to give myself some space for the tenor and alto, knowing that I have to move in contrary motion usually. So this is going to be tricky, because normally when you're going, normally when the bass goes up by step, you want every other voice to go down in contrary motion. So the fact that you have these parallel thirds uh, at the beginning uh, is, is going to be a little tricky. It's going to create, this is, this is why you're having trouble. Um, uh, so I'm going to say that again. Normally, what you want to do is if you have the bass moving up by step, especially if it's root position triads, these are all root position triads, especially then, you want all the upper voices to go down in contrary motion. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to avoid uh, parallel fifths, parallel octaves, or have complete chords with traditional doubling. So if we take what you have as our given, saying we want to have these parallel thirds, then we're going to have to we're going to have to give up some of other rule, probably doubling. So here, because parallel octaves are just not an option. So this is going to go down to there. And this would probably go down, and we'd probably double the leading tone, which is a pretty big no-no. Um, but it's better than having parallel fifths or parallel octaves, which then means I would continue to do that because, and here I have a unusual doubling. I'm doubling the root and the third and I'm omitting the fifth. And it's just a matter of like, otherwise I'm gonna have parallel fifths or octaves and those are just not an option. And then here, when we get to this, now, now that it's moving down, we have some options, right? This is a D. This can jump up to an F. This can go to our B. Then this would resolve to E, C. This can go to G. So we could do that. Let me, see, let me double check my work before I commit to it. I always like to double check on a piano. So we got. So we got this going to. Maybe because of this doubling here, because you're going to have unusual doubling, because this is a 7, it has to resolve down. Because of this, I would probably not go for the complete chord here. I would probably keep it this kind of like lighter, brighter sound. Uh, so yeah, I think this is what I would do. So let me tell you, let me re, re kind of re recap what I did and what's different. So I doubled the leading tone, which is not normally a good thing. I omitted the fifth, and I doubled the root in a deceptive resolution. I did double the third, like we would expect, but I doubled the root as well, and I omitted the fifth. So that's a little unusual. Here is a completely fine, nothing unusual about this 5-7 chord. Here, uh, I the third and omit given to you is like uh, requires you to break other rules and so what you have to learn is which is the rule you break first doubling omitting the fifth these are totally these are the first things to go um, 
parallel fits in octaves, it's not something you, that's last resort thing to break. Uh, so that's, that's what I would do for, for answering that question. And you can see that we do have like nice, nice melodic shape. We avoid all parallels. We have obvious chords that sound like the chords they're supposed to be. So good, good question. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really tricky one. Like when you're given something, you have to break a rule because it's so easy, especially when you're early on learning music theory that you're like, I can't break this rule, I can't break this rule. And sometimes, you know, you need to break a rule. And so it's a matter of a hierarchy of rules. And it's kind of like first choice, you follow all the rules. Second choice, you let this one go. And sometimes you let certain rules go because you have like uh, something that's more interesting, like a really interesting melodic line or harmonic idea or some inspirational thing that requires you to break certain rules. And so it's a, sometimes also a matter of percentage. If 90% of the tune follows the rules, when you break the rules, it's interesting and unique as opposed to if it was only 90% of the times you, you didn't follow the rules and then it would be like, why are they, why are they just randomly doing things weird and then normal, weird, normal. There's, there needs to be kind of like a, a reason, uh, 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 some kind of method behind the madness, let's say. All right. All right, okay. Uh, I got the piano tuned. I didn't. <laughs> I did. What I did is I brought in a digital piano. Uh, so so uh, right now I'm teaching, I'm doing this it's just, there's no, there's no classes going on, nothing's happening in person, so every piano has been like so out of tune. But I did bring in a digital piano because I got a couple uh, constructive criticisms from last time and I was like, oh, I felt so bad because it's like when it's out of tune, it's hard to hear. So you're welcome. I brought it in so you can hear things in tune. All right. You're welcome for those of you we're saying thank you, my pleasure. Okay, here's a question. How can I convert lyrics into vocal melody? Oh, geez. Okay, lyrics into vocal melody. Okay, so lyrics into vocal melody. Okay, so I am. I've written a few songs. I've composed a few songs in my life. Maybe I should bring one in sometime uh, and share it uh, just to kind of show you how I, I went. So I would say that I'm definitely not an expert in this area. So, but I, let, let me give you some, I always give you as much knowledge as I have. So in the area of lyrics, when we're talking about lyrics, we're already talking about um, text and words that's ready for music. Keep in mind that if we go farther back, you might have a story or a book or a, something like that, a bunch of words, that's not ready to be lyrics. And this is why you have people writing operas who have a librettist who writes the libretto. It's just like when you to convert like the Harry Potter books into the movies. You don't use every single word. You, you gotta condense things. You gotta come up with your screenplay. So the libretto is like the screenplay for an opera. But once you got the libretto, those are your lyrics that you're gonna set. So whether those lyrics become, go into like a, a popular song, uh, so again, pop song, like contemporary pop song, or even back in the day pop song, so like, a nice frotula, or let's say it's not a pop song, let's say it's a madrigal. Those lyrics might go into an opera, a madrigal, a frotula, a pop song, jazz song, whatever it is. We're not talking, we're not gonna talk about how you take the story and turn it into the lyrics. We're just gonna talk right now about how you put the lyrics into a vocal melody. And this certainly is something that when we talk about madrigals, especially the 16th century Italian madrigal, that, you know, there's a lot of thought that's, been go that's gone into this, uh, especially also with how to write, put, put the words 
into a vocal melody. When you're talking about uh, Mozart or Puccini or any of these great opera composers. They put a lot, they have a lot, you know, and some of them have said a lot about how they do it. So there's, uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can kind of look and see what some of these great writers, composers in the past did and see what was their methods and their methodologies. And stylistically, you can adapt that to your own style. There's, whenever there's a technique developed, there's a large portion of it that will be universal across all styles of music. And then there'll be some percentage that is unique to, let's say, 17, uh, sorry, classical opera like Mozart or late 19th century opera like Puccini. There will be certain things that are stylistic, but most of what they say is going to be universal. So the first big thing that is um, the relationship of syllables to pitch. So syllabic setting. So like Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. That's entirely syllabic. Every syllable gets a note. It might be a repeated note, it might go up, it might go down. So syllabic setting of the text. The opposite end of that is a melismatic setting. So if you think about one syllable with a bunch of different pitches. So classically, if we think about G Gloria, Gloria in excelsis Deo, syllabic at the end, but the Gloria part is melismatic. Uh, if we think in more contemporary times, think about like Stevie Wonder um, or a Mariah Carey or someone who's using a lot of ornamentation, those are, that's melismatic. And so you want to kind of have a, an idea. And then of course, you know, you can go like, well, what, what about somewhere in between? That's actually called pneumatic. So you want to think about the relationship of your syllables to your pitches. Like think about Beach Boys with ooh, ooh, the ooh, one syllable, multiple pitches. You might want to have some parts of your lyrics that are set melismatically. You might want to have others that are syllabic. Now, how do you decide which, which way to go? Well, syllabic is easier to understand for the listener. So if you have a, like a certain point where the lyrics, where the idea behind it is really critical, and you want to make sure that the audience can understand what's being said, you probably want to set, select, set that part syllabically. Something like ooh is great because like, it's, it's, just a, it's not conveying a, a language idea or concept, it's, it's a sound. But there's certain like, like love, the word love, which has been used so many times. So you can go love, you can on, on the of, uh, the vowel, you can definitely get melismatic because love, and it's such a common word, it's a, that's a great one to set melismatically. So also depending on how much repetition you're going to use, right? So you have the lyrics, but you're also going to have to keep in mind things like repetition. So the idea of a verse and a chorus. So the verse is going to have different words every time, same melody, but different words. The chorus will have the same words and same music. If you have a chorus, you can be a little bit more melismatic because you're going to hear it multiple times. And so maybe your listener doesn't get it on the first time they hear the chorus, but on the second or third time, they're like, oh, the word's love. I got it. God, we're singing about love. Whereas during the verse where you're talking about the storytelling part, you, you probably want to be a little bit more syllabic because you want to make sure you're only going to hear it once. You want to make sure that they get the story. This is interesting right here. And this is kind of, and I haven't really thought about this before. This is one of the reasons I love teaching is I start, I start making connections with the knowledge I have. The verse is kind of like 
the recitative of an aria, a recitative of an opera, rather. Whereas the chorus is kind of like an aria. It's not exactly, this is not an exact analogy. But the idea in an opera is that the recitative is more like spoken dialogue, so it's somewhere between speech and singing. And this is where the story gets told, who's going what. And the aria is often more melismatic, more melodic, and it's talking more about emotion. Story. And this idea of a verse, you know, I think of like a Billy Joel song, right? The verse is like telling the story of like Anthony worked at the grocery store. And then the chorus is kind of more of an emotional, I don't know if that holds for that song now that I think about it. But anyways, this idea of, of having different sections have different functions, story versus emotion. So as you're say, taking these lyrics and converting it to a vocal melody, text setting, dec the declamation, where, where, what it's functioning in is, is it part of telling a story or is it trying to convey the emotion? Like, of course, it's, everything is emotion, but it's a matter of degrees. And then uh, the rhythm. So, you know, rhythm and accent of the words. So if you think about how people talk, where there's, there's certain words that get accented. And it's really bizarre if, if you don't do it that way. So like when you say the word talk, the t is hard. And it's not talk, talk. The accent's not on the k of talk. So it's accent talk, not talk. But if you think about someone like uh, Christopher Walken, where his speech is a little bit halting, and sometimes he accents unusual parts of the phrase, and it's really unique, and he makes it work. And I heard a story, I don't know if this is true, that he would get a, when, he, when someone would send him a script, he'd have his secretary retype out the entire script with no capitalization and no punctuation. And he would just look at it as a bunch of words, no period, no commas, no anything like that, so that he could then be like, how am I going to pace this? Where am I going to pause? Where am I going to have an accent? So the rhythm and the accent of the words is really, really important. And so most of the time, you try, you try to have the rhythm and the accent as in alignment with the spoken word as possible. Again, if you want people to understand what your lyrics are, that's important. So think about setting the word talk. You're going to want to have that musically be somewhere where there's an accent. And so you think about vocal melody and what makes accents. Now, this is a huge subject. I'm not going to be able to go as in-depth as I actually want to right now. I can feel myself. That this is like, there's so many. This is such a rich subject, so it's a great question. So thinking about rhythm specifically. So um, let's just take some lyrics because it's always good. It's so easy to talk about things in the abstract. So when we talk about music theory, it's so good, it's so easy to just talk about these abstract concepts and not tie them to the actual sounds we're talking about. And so I think that's a, a pitfall that's easy to make. And especially when we're talking about here, I, I can feel myself making that already. I'm talking about the concepts without talking about an example. So let's, let's try to do a quick example. Um, so let's say uh, the, our lyrics are going to be, uh, how do you put lyrics to a vocal melody? That's our text. We're going to actually use the question as our words. So. How do, you put, how do you put lyrics to a vocal melody? How do you put lyrics to a vocal melody? How do you put lyrics to a vocal melody? How do, how 
how do you, and I'm think, I'm keep repeating this because I want to know about rhythm and pitch. So what words are going to have faster note values? Pitch, when it goes up or down. And I'm kind of taking these, these ideas that we've just talked about. How, how, this, this goes down when I say it. How, how do you put, and I put a little pause here. How do you put, how do you put lyrics, lyrics to a vocal, mel to a vocal melody, to a vocal melody? Maybe I put a little pause here. So how do you put, and here I go up, lyrics to a vocal melody. I put a little pause here. Now, this is not the only way to do it, right? But it's a way to do it. Uh, and there's more than one right answer. So where, where do I want things to be syllabic and melismatic? Where do I need to, where, what, what allows itself? What vowels? So vowels is also an important concept. How? I don't think I wanted to have anything. How do you put? I think lyrics might be a little bit melismatic, right? To a vocal and vocal, I might expand that a little bit melismatically. There's also something called word painting, where the music imitates the word. So if the word is vocal, I might do something more with the voice. Vocal melody. Uh, melody, you know, so that might be three blind mice, um, melody, and I don't know if I'm doing this. Let's say that's syllabic, right? So we're going to go mel, uh, d. And the word vocal, I might be a little bit more melismatic, but I'm trying to, and, I, and since this is the end, I want to go to a cadence, right? So let's, let's assume C major, right? And let me give myself the key. How, how, how. So I want to have the down side. So I'm going to go. So I'm going to go. How, how. Make these eighth notes. How. How do you? How do you, how do you put, how do you put, I don't, and then they are, do you put, so how do, how, how, how do you put, da, dee, da. So how, we make that a little bit like pneumatic, right? It's just a little bit how to get that way the speech works. How do you put, and normally put goes up, but you know, sometimes you make some modifications. Put, then lyrics, I would do something melismatic to a syllabic vocal melody syllab uh, syllabic. All right, so I, I'm not going to write out the, all the melismas and stuff, but that's how I would begin and end uh, the idea. And that's, these are some very, very rough general concepts. This is a rich area where you can definitely look up some more things. But I hope that gives you some ideas of things to consider as you're putting, putting together and trying to create a vocal melody once you've written out some lyrics, um, which is a great, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, I had so much fun when I was composing some songs. Um, and I, I did it one where I, I created the lyrics myself, uh, as well as sometimes I, I, there's a couple songs I wrote where I took a poem and I set it to music. So the words were given. I didn't create the lyrics. Both of them were a, lot, a real fun activity. So good. Great question. Whew. I love the challenge. All right. Uh, oh, good. I'm going straight to heaven. I'm the administrator, as well as the... The, the stuff, so thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I thought Bill Evans invented the G9 chord. 
Well, he's pretty, he's, he's up there. Bill Evans is, a, is my favorite jazz pianist. He's my favorite. Um, and he definitely didn't invent it, but this guy knew it. I, there was a story, actually. I, I knew uh, a, vocal, a vocalist who told the story about he was a pianist and a singer. And he was playing at the Village Vanguard opening set for Bill Evans. And after he played his set, he went up to Bill, who was at the bar, and said, hey, you know, I you know, really respect your work. Can you give me a little feedback? What did you think of, of what I did? And, and the story that was related to me is that Bill, Bill takes a cigarette out of mouth and goes, play more Bach. That's all he said, and then walked away. <laughs> Which I guess, you know, it's like one of those, those pieces of advice that you can never be wrong. It's like, you never can go wrong playing more Bach. Uh, but it's, it's funny that that was the, the entirety of the feedback Bill Evans gave uh, uh, a colleague of mine when he asked for some feedback. Uh, okay, Dr. B, explain aspects of soloing in a bebop style. Yes, yes I can explain that. Uh, again, it's like one of those topics that's so huge, but I think part of what these videos are good for um, is that it gives you an idea, and then it, it gives you something to go practice, work on, experiment with uh, on your own, in the practice room, um, in, your, in, your, in your basement, wherever it is you're practicing and doing stuff. So, bebop style. Uh, chromatic passing tones is the secret sauce for a bebop. So, let me, let me explain what I mean. Uh, you're going to take a C7 chord, C, E, G, B flat. So, you want, the main thing is you want chord tones. on downbeats. And you want to use predominantly eighth notes as your rhythm plus one beat of eighth note triplets every now and then. So if we talk about the bebop scale, you can't play a, a, a regular major scale and have it come out. It's, it's like not the right number of notes to fall all on downbeats from the octave. So what you have to do is you may need to have eight notes, not seven. So, one and two and three and four and one. So you need to have an extra note in there so that you can put the C on the downbeat, C on the downbeat. Now you'll notice that on downbeats we have the root, the flat seven, five, three. You'll notice that the major seven is a passing tone the sixth passing tone, the fourth, and the second, if we consider them upper structures, the 9, 11, and 13. But chord tones on downbeats, eighth notes, one beat of eighth note triplets. What that means is it's really common to see something like bomb, za bomb, bomb, da, da, da. Something like this. Eighth note rest on the beat one. One beat of eighth note triplets, not da 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 da. Lots of beats. One beat of eighth note triplets is stylistically the most common. And then you'll notice we just go down and we do the the bebop dominant. So this is called a bebop dominant scale. It's often done descending, but you can do it going up the scale. But descending is the most common. And it, it fits that, that idea. So, you know, if you don't know your bebop dominant scale, you learn it in every single key. And you go up, you go down, you do parts of it, you 
put little pieces like this. Da -da 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 -da. After you've done that, then what you want to do is you take a chord like the C7, and you say, how am I going to connect chromatically? Because there's a level, that's, so chord tones on downbeats, eighth notes, and one beat of eighth note triplets, and then chromaticism. Chromaticism is another important aspect for bebop, but it's chromaticism within a, diet, within a tonal context. So it's not, the chromaticism is still uh, relegated to primarily the uh, off beats. So if we take, let's say, B flat to G, that interval is a minor third. So if I go, uh, actually, let me miswrote that there. Let me fix that. So B flat, and G is my target. B flat, A, A flat, I need to go a lower neighbor. This is the formula for any time you have the span of a minor third. You get to go down chromatically, jump a half step below your target note so that it comes out so that it comes out just right on the downbeats, chord tones on downbeats. And you get this chromatic connection. Now, anytime you have a minor third interval, this is the formula, right? So on a C7, you can play that. And then G to E is another minor third. So you can do the exact same formula. Down a half step, down a half step, down a whole step, up a half step. And I am, but I am writing it out so it doesn't look like a whole step, right? It looks like a uh, diminished third. And that's because I'm in this idea of, so there's this idea of an enclosure. It's what they often call in, in jazz and bebop. Uh, and in classical music, they'll call it an upper and lower neighbor, neighbor tone. So the idea of if E is your target note, you have your upper neighbor, you have your lower neighbor, they enclose the target note, half step above, half step below, boom. So this idea of enclosure is something that's very, very popular in bebop as well. Finally, you have the third to the root is a major third. And here, this formula doesn't work. So this is the minor third formula. The major third formula is simply all chromatic because it, the way it time works out rhythmically, that's all you need. So you just go down the chromatic scale. That gives you the span of a major third. So if I play a C7 between the seventh and the fifth, from the fifth and the third, between the third and the root, So you then practice your bebop scale. You then practice these, these, um, the, the connections, the chromatic scale connections and enclosures between every dominant chord. You then convert that over to the major seven triads, uh, major, seven, major seventh chords, not triads, uh, minor seven, half diminished seven, so that you can do it on any chord between any chord member. That should keep you busy uh, if that's not something you already have. And you use that with these eighth notes, occasional eighth note triplets, and that's going to give you a, a huge percentage of what you need to be doing jazz bebop. Uh, the other big thing that you need to do is you need to transcribe some solos. Now, can you get the books where someone else already used their ear and wrote it out for you? Yes. Is that valuable? Yes, it is. You know what's even more valuable? Using your own ear and transcribing a solo. So you listen to a jazz solo of someone you like, and I say just pick four measures that you like to start with, right? You don't have to do the whole solo. Pick four measures, listen to it over and over, write out the notes, write out the rhythm, play along with it, with the recording, with headphones on, imitating it so, until you can play that technique. That whole transcription process of listening, writing it out, and then playing it on your instrument, whatever instrument that is, with the recording, and then analyzing it, and then transposing the things you like to different keys. So actually, 
I should probably write that out. So step one of the transcription process is to, let's say, write out, notate. Then play with recording. Then analyze, so do music theory analysis. Then transpose, lick to all keys. And then use in every spot possible in a tune. So let me explain this all for you, right? So in, when you transcribe, and there's, there's a awesome apps where you can slow it down. So if you're like, oh, Dr. B, it's too hard, I can't do it. There's apps, slow it down, do it half speed, whatever. Um, but, but figure it out, use your ear, right? Use your ear, get your ear, figure out the rhythms. One, two, three, four, one, ba da 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 dump. You're going to repeat over and over. You're going to listen to it a lot. But when you're transcribing, write it out. And you want to get the right pitches and the right rhythms. Not easy, but this is the task, right? Then, after you've written it out, you're going to need to figure out how to play it with the recording on your instrument. Now, this might mean that, at first, you can't play it as fast as you need to. So you might need to practice the actual piece to be able to get the technique up so that you can actually play it fast enough. But the goal is to get it so that you can then play with the headphones on. And when you have the headphones on and you're listening to the recording, you're playing it, you're trying to basically imitate exactly what they're doing on that recording. The exact phrasing, articulation, notes, rhythm, etc. And you're basically getting your ear into the style uh, on a level that's deeper than anything else can get you. After you've done all that, you can then analyze it. You can be like, oh, look, he's playing uh, one Passing tone, seven, six, five. Okay, this is that lick. Got it. This, you analyze everything you wrote out. Then, if there's a specific lick or, or a bit of melody that you like, let's say, ba -da 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 -da, you like, ba -da -ba -da 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 -da. Let's, like, let's say this is the lick you like. Right? You analyze it. One, three, five, seven, one. Uh, let's call it that flat seven. Passing tone, flat seven, passing tone, five. You then say, okay, I'm going to play this in all 12 keys so that you can, that no matter what chord comes along, you got this under your, under your fingers and in your ear. So you then transpose it to every key. Then you take a tune. Let's say you're going to take a blues or I've got rhythm or all the things you are. And you say, anytime it's possible for me to, anytime there's a dominant chord in any key, not just the C7, anytime there's a dominant chord where I can do this lick, I'm going to do it. Very mathematical. Every possible place, you, do, you just insert the lick through a tune. That's the transcription process. That's how you get good at playing like jazz bebop. You take some of these concepts, you do these transcriptions, you start applying it, and then you start learning the tunes. All right, great question. All right, let's see where we're at here. Okay. All right. Uh, one second, one second. We've got a lot of great questions in the chat. Uh, okay, can you discuss the voice leading in Mamma Mia by ABBA? Uh, I, I'll make a note of that. Uh, so I'm going to make notes over here where you can't see it. Uh, orchestration was one big one. Lyrics was a great question. I, you know, I. I'm not going to be able to get to everything, but eventually it goes on my list. Um, uh, Abba, Mamma Mia. I don't have that with me now, obviously, but that's something I could, that would be a, certainly a fun one to do. I had a, when I was a young Dr. B, I had my cassette player with my Abba cassette. So I, I have that in my, uh, in my, from my childhood. All right, yep, six chord, yep, we got that. I still have to be to, to beaming of the notes and different time signatures. I'm expecting a comprehensive lesson on that too. <laughs> Thanks in advance. Okay, yeah, so beaming. Uh, beaming's a great, uh, great question that's often 
you know, misunderstood on how to do it. And you know, it's like, thank goodness music notation software has gotten better because when it first came out, you'd have people who don't really know how to write music, don't know the conventions of beaming, and they just put it into some music notation software. And you'd have this stuff that, you know, the computer can play it, but any human being with, like, you can't read it. It's like illegible, even though it's like correct because the beaming is all wrong and the patterns that you've, as someone who reads music that you've established in your brain, it doesn't fit that. Um, most music software does a pretty good job now of doing the correct beaming automatically, but not always. Um, so it is valuable to know the rules of beaming. It's also valuable in terms of getting better as a, a performer in terms of being able to sight read things. So a comprehensive lesson on beaming. I'm going to give you a short one on beaming. And this is what I like to do. I like to, let's take, um, let's take a, a, a time signature that maybe you're not as familiar with, or is not as popular, a 6-8. And I'm going I'm to write a bunch of notes with no beaming at all. Um, and some note values that should not be used in, in any way like I'm using. Uh, so let's start with that. Eighth, eighth, quarter, quarter, half, eighth, sixteenth, sixteenth. Nothing is beamed, and some of the note values are not the ones you would use. So the concept is that in a 6-8, you have two beats. And you can, that's, some people, how you call it? The big beat, one, two, three, four. The little beat, 6 eighth notes, but the big beat is going to be one, two. And you want the beats to be obvious to people looking. So the problem here is you, like, I can't point to the note head that's the beginning of big beat two. It's halfway through this note. So what you do is you split it apart into two eighth notes and you tie it. And then you want to beam everything that's within a beat. So if I have flag, 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 I can beam all three of those like so. Then I have the tie. Here the flag is fine because I got a quarter note after net. And you can't, you can't, you don't break, you don't break notes apart that are within the beat. You only break a note apart that goes over the beat. Because I now can say, look, there's beat two. So as I'm tapping my foot, I can go tap, tap. Even though there's no sound that starts there, I can see it. And that's what's that's what's valuable. Same problem here, I'm gonna have to break this apart because I a beat in 6-8 is a dotted quarter. So I need to break this half note into a dotted quarter tied to an eighth. So I can look and I can say, right there, that's beat two. That note head, right there. That's what I want to be able to do. So dotted quarter, now I have a flag. All of this goes within the next beat. So I can beam all of this together. I put in my tie. So Everything here is all beat two. This is all beat one. I beam whatever's within a beat that's possible. I turn the flags into beams. So the eye can see this is beat one, this is beat two, this is beat one, this is beat two. You can kind of like circle the different beats and, they're, and, you, and there's, you don't have to go through the middle of a note head, which is what would have happened if, with this if it was written like that. The computer would play this the exact same way as this. But for a performer, this is the way that's so much easier to read. Um, so I do, I do have some stuff like this in, I believe, lesson two or three of my, on, on the playlist, where I do talk a, a bit about this kind of thing with beaming. As with every topic, there's always more that can be said. Um, so hopefully that gets you some, some ideas of six, eight, but then, you know, 4-4, four, 2-4, four, 3-4, four, 6-4, four, four, there's a whole bunch of different time signatures. And there's, the, the concept stays the same, but it's the application is going to look very different. All right. 
Orchestra, okay, I have another question. This is from Daniel. I've been spending some time trying to work out some orchestral style music by ear. Any tips for working out some of the busier sections? Um, so I don't know if you're talking about transcribing when you say work out. Um, or whether you're trying to just say, okay, what instruments are doing what. There's two things that are, are very, very valuable when you're kind of getting better at orchestration in terms of developing ear. One is go to a live concert so that when you hear a sound, you can look and be like, that person's fingers are moving. That's the instrument. Oh, look, it's the bassoon. Oh, and so the French horn's doing something too. Like live music. Like, no matter what you do, uh, when you have two speakers, you know, it's just, it's coming from the speaker, right? And it, it's kind of panned and it's, and it's great, but it's different than actual having like a 30, 40 foot wide stage where the sound's coming from absolutely a different location on that stage. And it's easier for you to pinpoint the different sounds and then you can use your eyes and look at the instrument that's creating that sound. So go to a live concert. I lived in, in Manhattan for seven or eight years and when I was doing my master's at NYU and I would go up to Carnegie Hall pretty much once or twice a week and I would stand outside about 30 minutes before a concert was going to happen and I'd be like, anyone have an extra ticket? Anyone have an extra ticket? Very often someone would say, oh, I've got an extra ticket and you know, so and so so couldn't make it. And they'd be like, uh, you, you know, it was a $60 ticket. And I'd be like, well, I'm a student. I, I can give you $10. And they would almost always be like, yeah, here you go. $10 is fine. Or some, sometimes people would be super generous and just be like, ah, you're a student? Yeah, it's on me. The ticket would have been wasted anyways. Um, so I've, I went and, and I got to hear elite level orchestras at least once a week for a number of years at Carnegie Hall. And I used to, you know, often it was up high in nosebleed section sometimes. But I would be down there and I'd be looking and I'd be scanning trying to hear what instrument's doing what and hear how they interact with the other, other instruments. So that helps you when you're listening and trying to figure out a busier section. You're, you kind of train your ears to become more and more acute to the details and you're using all your resources, you're using your eyes, your ears, everything. The other thing is don't do it by ear. Study a score. Get a score for the music. Follow along as you're listening. So that, again, you're, you're, you, know, you definitely want to develop your ears, but sometimes you want to give your ears a little bit of a, a boost by using your eyes. And so if you can say, I really want to listen for I see here that it says these are the instruments playing. Let me listen for it. Let me see if I can hear it. So that's, that, that would be another way that I think would be really valuable to help you develop your ears and figuring out busier sections in, of, of a orchestral, orchestral work. Uh, Daniel follow up, sometimes strings blend together so well it's hard to tell how many voices are playing and what the intervals between them are. Yeah, it is hard. So there's a, a fundamental principle with learning music. Um, you need to make it easy enough that it's possible. And then you, as soon as you master that, you then make it a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. This, this applies to learning almost anything, but especially it's obvious in music. So if you listen to a Chopin piece and you're like, oh, I can't play it that fast at all, not even close. The answer is play it so slow that you can't make a mistake. Let me say that again. Figure out what's the tempo that it's impossible for you to make a, play a wrong note. Play it at that tempo. Nice and steady, 100% accuracy. Get into your ear what it sounds like correct. That's so important because your subconscious is going to remember whatever you put in it. If you put in the right notes, it's going to remember. And it's going to try to get you to do it again. By the same, on the other hand, if you play it wrong, it goes into your subconscious and your subconscious is going to try to make you play it wrong again. It's the whole idea between good habit, behind good habits and bad habits. That happens with music too. So the idea is play something so slow you can't make a mistake so the correct sound goes into your subconscious, into your conscious, then sifts down to the subconscious 
and then it just kind of gets there. And then at a certain point, you need to, don't need to think about anything. You've, you've put everything correct into your subconscious and everything just flows. That's the secret. That's it. Uh, and when you're learning something like, oh, I can't hear the blend of these, these strings, you need to do something that's simpler. So this is where you know, having friends and being like, hey, hey, I wrote something. Could you just have you know, violin and violin one, violin two? Could you just play that two thing together? You make it smaller. You make it simpler. You make it something that you're able to hear at whatever level you're at currently. And once you've mastered that, you then make it to the next level. So if you can't hear how an entire string section blends in the intervals between it, that might be too complicated for you. That's fine. Put into Finale or Sibelius two violin parts. You know what it is, right, because you put it in. But then listen back to it and say, you know, wait the next day, see if you forget it a little bit, and be like, OK, can I, can I transcribe that? Can I figure out, like, much like what I was talking about with the jazz bebop solos. Can I transcribe? Can I figure out what that is by ear? What is that interval? With just the two voices. And you might remember it, so you, you know, but you're like, OK, let me, let me just really try to hear it. And then try to do three voices, and then four voices, and then five voices. Like, you, but slowly, do it very slowly. It's so easy to be impatient and want to be like, I'm an all-star. I can do everything. Beethoven got nothing on me. It's just not the way it works. You got to be, you got to, you got to, Learn to love the process of mastering something to perfection. There's something really good about being perfect, right? And people be like, oh, Dr. B, nobody's perfect. I'd be like, let's define our context. Define your scope. Yes, I, you can be perfect if you say, here are the parameters. This is what it takes to be perfect. I've now hit all of those things. So if I say, here's, you tell me what intervals I play for you on the piano and you name all the intervals, you can get a perfect score. You can be perfect at that. And that's what you want to get comfortable with as you're, you're figuring out how to get that, hear the blend and how that is. Break it down into smaller pieces. Slow down the metronome marking if you're working on something that's too fast for you. Okay, next question here. We've got, hi, I'm trying to write music with a guitar playing chords and several other melodic instruments accompanying those chords. How do the rules of four-part harmony apply when there are so many more tones? Good question. Good question. Um, and I think this might be our last, last question I take for today. Uh, I know it's, we're not getting up on the, I try to keep things under the two-hour mark for the battery, for uh, the, everything that's being used here to record it. Uh, but I, it's also really hot, and I could start feeling myself getting a little lightheaded. And I would hate to pass out on camera here for you all. Uh, though that might be a great meme. Uh, anyways, so let's talk about this one a little bit. So for, with a guitar playing chords, several other melodic instruments accompanying those chords. So that's a, first off, that's a little unusual way to phrase it. Usually melody instruments don't accompany the chords. I think I know what you mean. It's like go along with. Uh, accompany usually means as a, as a backing up. So usually the guitar playing the chords is going to be the quote unquote accompaniment. So you got some melodic instruments, several other rules of four part harmony apply. Okay, so uh, several, let's say we've got three melodic instruments. Um, rules of four part harmony. Keep in mind that in the lessons that I have up at each stage, uh, there's not, not at each stage, but at, at certain points, we do talk about, I do talk about three-part harmony. Right? So this goes into like what you omit, right? Like omit the fifth of a chord, of a triad, of a major or minor triad. So omit fifth, major or minor. Um, you can do that, right? You don't have to, right? Because you, you have, if it's a triad, you can do all three notes. But sometimes for voice leading, you're going to omit the fifth. Um, let's also say five melodic instruments, right? So when he says several, say more than, less than four, less, less than four, and more than four. So with three, or let's say two, whatever, you have to say, well, what are the critical notes? Now, if we have a guitar playing the chord, chords, we've got the complete chords here. 
you're going to want to have as close to complete chords here as well. The idea is that each section, the guitar section, the melodic instrument section, has as much of the complete chord as possible. Now, what's nice is that if you have the guitar playing the chords, even if you're just using partial with the melodic instruments, it's covered in the guitar. But you're going to strive to have as complete as possible. And the rules are going to be the same in terms of voice leading, right? So if, we, if you look at whatever lessons had the, um, the penalty cards with the orange card, blue card, the different levels of rules. So you're not going to want to have parallel fifths and octaves unless that's the style of the music. So if you're playing metal, parallel fifths are, your, are great. That's your power chord. Great. Um, sometimes writing parallel octaves or in unison is super powerful. Think, I mean, Beethoven, Mozart used the orchestral unison. They, they said, okay, we're not doing harmony at all. We're having the powerful unison. But that, they, didn't, they didn't pretend it was four-part harmony. They said, it's not four-part harmony. It's the orchestral unison. So these things are possible. You just have to know what you're doing. So if you're, or you have to have the, has to be put into the appropriate section. You have to say consciously, this is the section that's the orchestral unison. This is the, the, the harmony section. Now, whether it's four part, three part, five part, accompanied by cor uh, guitar chords, this, this varies depending on your ensemble. But when you're writing harmony, you're gonna follow the rules, which means the seventh of the chord resolves down, Leading tones often resolve up. You avoid parallel fifths and octaves. Um, the, the intervals that the third of the chord is the most important thing. Like, you're, you know, if you got the chord being played here by the guitar, the root might not be as necessary as it was in, in regular four part harmony. The thirds, uh, if you're dealing with a seventh chord, the seventh. If there's a seventh, that's going to be very, very important. So what you leave out are often going to be the fifth and maybe the root. Now, if it's a diminished fifth or an augmented fifth, it's important. You've got to keep it in. It's only the perfect fifth that you can leave out. And sometimes you can leave out the root if the guitar is playing those complete chords, especially if the guitar is playing something down low uh, with the thumb, getting, making sure you get some bass note in there. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have five melodic instruments, how do the rules of four-part harmony work? Well, obviously, you have an additional doubling. Um, and so what you basically do is you, 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 tr you kind of have a couple options, I guess. One is you take, of your five instruments, you may, maybe combine two into one. So you might be like, OK, the trumpet and sax, like let's say tenor sax and trumpet, are going to play in unison or in octaves, more likely. And we're going to treat that as a singular voice. And this is something that orchestration often happens. Um, orchestration, four-part harmony means that there's four separate melodic lines. But you can double those lines, either at the octave or at the unison, octave above, octave below. This often what happens in an orchestra, where you have the strings playing four-part harmony, and then the wind section's doing the same thing, but with their instruments and their orchestral timbre color. Uh, and they have the complete chord. But there might be, but if you look at a cross, it's doubling. And sometimes you'll have doublings within those sections. So you'll have the flute, the sound of the flute and clarinet, right? So it's, with orchestration, you're sometimes creating new instruments, if you think about it in a certain, from a certain perspective. There's the sound of the flute, the sound of the clarinet. You put those two instruments together playing the exact same thing at the exact same time, you kind of have a new sound, the flute clarinet. It's a blend of those two sounds, and it sounds slightly different. So if you're dealing with more melodic instruments, you might be doing something like that, where you might be taking two instruments and blending them by either having them play at the unison or the octave into a one new sounding instrument. That's a combination of the two. Or you might actually have five separate parts, in which case you need to, to, to have more doubling. So if you're dealing with triads, but you got five voices, right? So you could have root, root, third, third, fifth. So what is it, what is it that you're going to have two of, and what is it that you're going to have one of? 
is I guess basically the question. Um, and I think your answer is it's gonna be pretty flexible and it's gonna have primarily do with what makes good voice leading, what makes a good melody, so what comes before and what comes after. Uh, and then just to don't double or overly double tendency tones. Okay, so your tendency tones are your seventh of a chord and the leading tone. These are your tendency tones, right? Because they have to resolve in a certain direction. So you might, you know, you might avoid doubling those. Whereas in other cases, you know, go ahead to have two roots, two thirds. Um, you know, in general, the root would probably be the one you would most likely have a double of. And the third and the fifth, so you, you know, could either be one. So you could have root, root, three, five, five, or root, root, three, three, five. I think both of those would be pretty common and, and work out fine. Again, depending on voice leading. But there can always be exceptions. You can also have like the, the tripled root. Okay, so you could have root, 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 third, fifth. Right, so this might be, so one option, two options. These are probably your, your three most common options for that kind of doubling. So that's really the question when you're, you're dealing with that. What's nice about having a guitar playing the chords is that you know you always, the listener is always hearing the complete chord with reasonable doubling and a reasonable voicing. And then it's a matter of getting your, your instruments. So whether you're writing arrangements for like a wedding band or a jazz ensemble or a wind ensemble or some kind of orchestral chamber group, um, it's the voice leading. Don't, don't double, I mean, you can double a tendency tone, but don't do, do it too much. Try not to. So avoid doubling tendency tones. And then just figuring out what your other doublings are based on on uh, voice leading. So, hey, thanks everyone for joining me. Keep it, you, all, you all know it's going to be archived on, on the, my YouTube channel. And uh, the semester is starting pretty soon. I think I'll be able to do another one two, uh, in two weeks from now. And, uh, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're on Patreon, shoot me an email about questions you want me to prepare ahead of time. I'm taking notes on stuff. Uh, ABBA it's got my imagination going on. We'll see if I can put something together. And if I don't get to it, my apologies. Uh, part of what this is is, um, is that uh, some, some music theory thing presents itself. I get really excited about it. I write everything out. And so there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know, necessarily want to use the word capriciousness or let's use the word spontaneity. There's a little bit of spontaneity in terms of which question I'm going to uh, be excited to tackle for any given weekend. But hope to see you in two weeks. Have fun. Lots of stuff to work on. Enjoy the music. Thank you.